Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner, and today I'm joined by my old pal, the three biggest names in hard-boiled fiction, Max Allen Collins, right here, right now. How are you, mate? I'm fine, and when I'm with you, one of my favourite people on the planet, not just Forbidden Planet, the entire <laughs> planet, is, is Andrew Sumner, and uh, what a great friendship we have uh, forged here in the world of Titan. Absolutely forged in the world of Titan, forged on the mean streets of central London. Absolutely <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> now, Get mate, Carter well, has nothing on us. So true. Absolutely right. And I've taken that train journey with the Roy <laughs> Budd soundtrack in my head. And it's an absolute treat. Reading Farewell, my lovely. Yeah, correct. <laughs> the only thing I didn't have was the shotgun. But uh, I, I, I did ask for a beer and a straight glass when I got to the pub. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> so, mate, we're here. To, we've, got, we've got a couple of things to talk about. Primarily a real treat, which is that it's, it's, it's soon to be the publication date. And it is the solicitation cycle for the third Titan Comics volume of the Ms. Tree archive. Um, it's Mystery Volume 3, The Cold Dish, yeah, which is this epic project collecting your glorious Mystery comics created with yourself and Terry Beatty. So, mate, what can you tell me about Archive Number 3? Well, of course, since it's the third volume, it's the beginning. Yeah. Right? <laughs> just, that's just how perverse we are. But I, we, we, we did uh, a year, we did, I think, 10 graphic novellas for DC right at the end of the run of Miss Tree. And I felt they, I, I really felt they were, would be very welcoming to readers. So I decided we would, we would lead with those. And now we're going back to 1981, when after, what would you say, 20, 30 years of no crime comics in America, uh, we just knocking our heads against the wall said, we're gonna do crime comics. We, you know, we love DC, we love the spirit, I was writing Dick Tracy, the comic strip at the time. So we decided to tackle something that nobody really wanted. And it, it worked at least to the degree that we lasted 50 issues, which is a, it's the longest run any private eye comic book has ever achieved. And, and there's something like 10 other issues, 3D issues. And for example, we were initially a serial in Eclipse magazine, yeah, as I think you know, and uh, it, as I know, and as you may recall, I, I own, and in fact, still yeah. own those issues of the magazine. I think I sent you some pics of them over the summer when I was back at my mum and dad's place. I've still got those, and 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 for that reason, that first serial was printed in black and white, and we haven't colorized it. it it's yeah, even though the other stuff in the in, in the volume is co in color as it was published, and it really. I like to think, I don't know if it's not modest, but I'm going to take some credit for that the entire crime comics, noir comics thing that, that, that has exploded over the last couple of decades. I mean, we laid, we laid the platform for that. Yeah, we I, I, think you, I think you and Terry should take all the credit for it. I think you you laid the platform, you laid the landing strip, strip. You, you you were the architects on the landing strip. And then I think you built the landing strip with your bare hands and installed the lights. You know, I, I, I think I, I don't think there's any ifs, ands or buts about it. It's exactly what you guys did. And, and that's the same kind of torturous metaphor I frequently write. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I, I get that from reading your prose, mate. <laughs> Uh, but of course, the way it all began, I, don't know, I, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but there's a guy named Dean Mullaney who did uh, Eclipse Comics and, and the Eclipse Magazine. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, he, he now is at IDW doing fantastic work. It's where I, I was one of the editors and I wrote the introductions to the complete Dick Tracy. I got to write about every single year of, of Chester Gould's Dick Tracy right up to when I took over. And, and that was Dean's doing. Well, Ms. Tree was Dean's doing because Terry and I have been trying to sell something to the Tribune Company syndicate, the Dick Tracy people. And we had tried out on a number of things. We almost got Annie when oh, wow. they went out and got this newcomer named Leonard Starr. I don't know <laughs> what the hell that was about. When they could have had Beatty and Collins. I mean, yeah. come on. Uh, and, uh, but but we, we did for about a year or two a 
weekly comics page for weekly newspapers and syndicated it ourselves and ourselves and it was modestly successful our best client was the chicago reader and they bought it to only run the mike missed minute mystery and that appeared in in the chicago reader and that was a traditional private eye minute mystery and dean followed it there and then of course he knew i did dick tracy so he called me and said I'd like you to do something for the, our, this new magazine, Eclipse Monthly. And he had all kinds of like phenomenal people lined up. Uh, you know, people like Marshall Rogers. I mean, this, this, I think Trina Robbins, who I love was in there. Names I, names I revered and, and a couple of people who had not really done any comics professionally, me and Terry Beatty. And uh, he, so he was familiar with Terry through Mike Mist. So on the phone, I pitched Ms. Tree off the top of my head it's because I, I've done that. I did it with, with Road to Perdition too. If they say you have something, God damn right I have something. You know? And I, I thought, well, I did a twist on my camera because I know my camera back, backwards and forwards, as you know, as my, my camera editor. And I said, well, let's, uh, let's flip it and the Mike Hammer style character will marry the Velda style character, Velda being his beautiful secretary, beautiful, you know, brunette, tall, curvaceous secretary. They're finally going to get married. And then on their wedding night, spoiler alert, he gets killed. He's murdered. Her name is Michael, just as his name is Michael. So she says, I don't even have to change the name on the door. And she takes over and she was a police she was a cop herself basically a meter maid but yeah. she she was a cop and so she takes over and her first case is solving her her husband's murder solving mike's murder and then it went on from there we didn't know we we're going to do any more than one serial i think we were doing something like eight page increments like the spirit yeah, like a spirit that's exactly system. right it was yeah. and then the last episode was double length and so um, the surprise was it was extremely popular. It was basically the breakout success of, uh, of Eclipse Monthly. And we got spun into our own color comic book, which um, Dean Mullaney published. And he published, I think he published something like 10 issues. Anyway, all of that's in, in the cold dish. And one of the things that Terry and I fell into very quickly was very much a, a newspaper strip style soap opera element the idea that there's going to be story arcs and they're going to continue that a mystery will be so, solved but there'll be elements that lead us into the next story uh there there's there, there's a a son that turns up early on and he that's dealt with in, in this volume and we also fell into doing this was one of the reasons uh, i wanted to do it when I was doing the Dick Tracy comic strip, we did a lot of contemporary crimes. And that really was a Chester Gould trademark that he, because you go in the 30s, he's doing Dillinger and, and Bonnie and Clyde basically when he's doing his villains. So I wanted to do modern crimes, but there were all kinds of things that were too touchy for the Tribune to allow me to do. If I tried to do abortion clinic bombings, I tried to do you know, gay bashing, I tried to do all of these, you know, th these kinds of topics that uh, a date rape, they didn't want anything to do with that. Well, Ms. Tree being part of the independent comics movement, I could do anything I wanted to. Yeah, and yeah. so we did, we did all kinds of topical things. Unfortunately, most of those topics are still problems in society. Yeah. Uh, Amazing. I mean, amazingly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you read this stuff we did in the eighties and nineties and, and it's, it's, could be porn from the headlines of, yeah. of today. Uh, and we also wanted to play with consequences. And that is that um, she's a vigilante of sorts, at least as pertains to her husband's, the people responsible for her husband's death. Well, in our world, in the world of this continuing story, we say, well, now what happens to her? Well, well she went to prison for a while. And she got out of prison by going to a mental institution. Yeah. And then for a while she's on, as, as the story progresses, she's 
she's on medication and people want her to respond like Ms. Tree and she's mellowed out on her medication. And she, so we had a lot of fun with saying, okay, we're not gonna just keep repeating the same story over and over and over again. We're gonna take a story and see where it leads into the next story. And uh, I think that was some of the secret of how we were able to survive in a not really friendly environment. It was a yeah. very superhero oriented, uh, even more than today, superhero oriented environment. And then you also have the fact that Terry and I were just resolutely doing, you could call it simple artwork if you want to, but we were trying to do, we thought there's a lot of stuff going on. It was very designy, hard to read a page, you know, your eye wasn't being led where it should be led. And we said, let's go back to, you know, let's go back to Johnny Craig. Yeah. Let's go right. back to the new and newspaper, uh, you know, Kniff style storytelling, the, the, the purity of it. And I really think Terry is at, I won't say he's at his best in that first story. It's a very different style when you look at the first story, very pure. Um, and he, he gradually gets more realistic as he goes on. And he, he's very Eisner influenced as he goes on. But early on, there's a, there's a, a beauty to that, that artwork in the very first story that just has a kind of a sheen to it that I've always loved. I think that's absolutely right. As you as you may recall, not only do I have the uh, the uh, Eclipse monthlies, but I also have the original um, collection that was done back in the day of that story, uh, which um, we once chatted about. And uh, in fact, you've you've seen it. And uh, and then I, I, that's why I'm such a big fan of, of this Volume Three collection. But I think what Terry's artwork has is a kind of elementality to it. When I look at it, that it's it's, I think it's almost feels like it's mystery in, in her purest form to I me. Think so. And of course, you see, that you see a husband, Michael Tree in this, Mike Tree in this one, and uh, and of course he looks he looks exactly like the newspaper comic strip version of Mike Hammer, which I thought really? was a beautiful. Uh, yeah, I never noticed that. <laughs> Which I, I thought never was noticed a great that because I didn't want to get sued. Fortunately, yeah. <laughs> I'm in tight with the Spillane estate, as you know. Yeah. Well, indeed, as the as the current co-author of all the new Mike Hammer novels, which of course we work together on, as you mentioned. Now, I want to wrap up this part of the conversation by saying, Mystery Volume Three: The Cold Dish. It's an amazing collection for me. It, I've loved Volumes One and Volumes Two, but th this this is the real apex of the series oh, thus far you. as collected. I think it's wonderful stuff, and it is available for pre-order at the links attached to our conversation from ForbiddenPlanet.com. But uh, Max, there are two other things I want to get into before we sure. uh, wave goodbye. Uh, the first of which is to flip out of comics for a second and just talk about your latest Nolan novel, uh, Double Down, also available from the links attached to this conversation from Hard Case Crime. Well, Nolan was the first thing I sold. Uh, it was, there's was a book called Bait Money, followed up by a book called Blood Money. And uh, Charles Ardai, who you know well, the editor at uh, Hard Case Crime, was a big fan of those early books. And when he began Hard Case Crime, he wanted to reprint them, which we did in, a, as a double volume. Well, he's been after me to write a new Nolan. And I did, I finally did Skim Deep, which has been out a few months now. And, but part of the deal was he'd bring everything else back out and he's done them. He's doing them in again, double, double down. There, there are two books in each, but they're related because again, it's me writing kind of a long saga so you, you, you know, you're not just starting over and getting another adventure. You, you know, there, there's a through line. And uh, this is a book called, originally a book called Flypaper and a book called Hush Money that have been joined together. One has to do uh, with the Comfort family. We were talking off camera about, Indeed. about yeah. the Cole Cold Comfort, Comfort Farm and how I, I named Cole Comfort after, uh, after Cold Comfort Farm, the great uh, British novel, uh, comic novel by Stella Gibbons. And, uh, and, and they enter the Nolan saga, and then also there's the skyjacking. And then I do a kind of, I show what happens to an executioner type of character, you know, the character, the executioner. Yeah, Matt Bowen, yeah, who led to the Punisher. Yeah, yeah, led to the Punisher. 
I wanted to say what happens to a guy who tries to do that in Nolan's world. Yeah. And it's it's different than what happens in <laughs> this world. Fantastic. I, I mean, it is really such a fantastic collection. And it goes side by side. That's Double Down by Max Allen Collins, right. the new Nolan from Hard Case Crime, which uh, you can also, from the links attached to this conversation, not just by that, but by all the other Nolan Hard Case Crime novels as well, you'll find that we've also got uh, Skim Deep. We've also got Two for the Money. And um, what else do we have? This are there any Mike Cameron novels available? Yeah, there are indeed. Uh, what you will find, <laughs> what you will find, Masquerade for Murder, notwithstanding, is like you will find a glorious cornucopia of Max Allen Collins books if you check out these links. And before we part, I want to touch upon another great creation of uh, of yours and Terry Beatty's, um, which you created for DC Comics. Sadly, because if you created it for Titan Comics, I've got a feeling you might be in better shape. But no. one of my favourite strips of yours uh, from your DC era is Wild Dog. Uh, but some interesting things have been happening to Wild Dog of late. Is that not right, Max? That's true. Without, without our knowledge, uh, Wild Dog was put into the Suicide Squad, and he's now announcing himself, the character's announcing himself, as the leader of the January 6th insurrection and says that he, he took a dump on Nancy Pelosi's desk. Uh, apparently this version of Wild Dog, you have to follow up with, you have to come behind him with a pooper scooper. And uh, it, it's, it's maddening. It, it, it's funny in a way, but it really shows the lack of respect, not only from, from DC, who I worked for for many years, and that's where I did Road to Perdition, my, you know, my, my signature your, your work. Your signature creation, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and something that's brought a lot of glory and money to DC Comics. But they, nobody bothered to give us a heads up about this, let alone to ask us whether it's something we would approve, which we would not. That is not our character. That is not the way our character would behave. Yes, he was a vigilante, but he, he, he would be standing up with the police. He would not be a seditionist. Uh, this it's it's out it's outrageous to us, and uh, the the fact that uh, that a writer and I don't know this guy, the idea that he would take somebody else's creation and just feel well DC owns it, so I can do whatever I want to with it, and I can you know does doesn't matter if it if, if it makes any sense to to where the character was, and it's my take on it. Well, my take is that your take sucks. Yeah, don't mince your words, Max. Just tell it. Just to. tell it. Tell I'll them. Tell, them what, tell them what you think. Tell them what you think. All right. Well, mate, I think that's very well said, brother. And um, you know, I know how much Wild Dog means to both you and to Terry. So you know, to, you know, I, I I completely empathize with your point of view. Well, and, I, I should mention that when you know Wild Dog was, some people have said, well, he's a minor character. Who cares? Well, you know, we had a pretty good run with a uh, mini series. We were in Action Weekly. We had a, you know, we had a special. And then they've used him in three or four other comic books. Fine. And they put him on Arrow, the TV show Arrow. He's a character on Arrow where he was an Hispanic character, Latino character. So that doesn't really jibe with making him somebody, you know, who's an insurrectionist either. And I have to mention, DC did not inform us that they were putting him on Arrow. And we only got paid after I went public and complained about the fact that we hadn't been paid anything for it. Then suddenly, oh, I guess, yes, I guess it does say in your contract issue. So I always come back to, to the, you know, I, they're wonderful people at DC I've worked with over the years. But as a business, you've got to say that they still remain to this day, a corporation built on the bones of two Cleveland teenagers. There we go. That thanks for sharing that with me, mate. I think you've been been very, very clear and um, and uh, to back to a more a, a more uh, I'm very clear about your great creation, Wild Dog. And back to a more positive iteration of one of your great creations. You've been watching Forbidden Planet TV with Max Allen Collins. Not just talking about his Nolan books from Hard Case Crime, but talking about his glorious Ms. Tree series created by himself and the great. Terry Beatty, who we've just been talking about. And you can pre-order Ms. Tree, The Cold Dish, Volume 3, 
the links attached to this conversation, and you can order volumes one and two, and you can order a glorious cornucopia of Max Allen Collins hard boiled goodness right here. And I'll come to your house personally and, and autograph everything you buy. How's there that you go. Me? How how's that for a disturbing threat slash <laughs> offer? <laughs> Take care, brother. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you, Andrew. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.